Good morning and welcome back to Tech Week TV. Today we're here in Dunedin. My name is Jake Miller. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Unfiltered and I'm incredibly humbled today to be joined by uh, two pretty amazing people doing some really big things in the world of the Internet of Things. So today's session is, is about the Internet of Things. Are we ready for this continued change? We're going to kick off with a couple of presentations uh, by our guests and then we're going to go into a bit of a panel discussion on that. So uh, thank you for being here. Uh, it's day four of Tech Week, uh, day four or five. We're here in Dunedin today, back in Auckland tomorrow, so stay with us tuning in throughout the day. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Brandon, the founder and CEO of Tether. Thank you so much for, for thanks, being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, and also Nicholas the, uh, from Open Parallel. So Nicholas, thank you so much for, for being here as well. Thank you for so, having me. Gentlemen, we'll start off with these presentations. So uh, I'll, I'll pass over to you, uh, Brandon, and we can, uh, we can go from there. Cool. So, hi everyone. My name is Brandon from Blurk. I am the founder and CEO of Tether. Um, essentially, we are a Kiwi startup that enables healthy living, learning, and working environments through connected hardware and software solutions. So, I thought I'd take a bit of a different approach today, as opposed to just going through um, our products and services and what Tether is. Maybe um, giving an introduction into how <coughs> I started or how our team started, and what it really takes to build a tech business. So. Um, Essentially, the first question you have to ask yourself, or what I asked myself when I was really young, is are you an entrepreneur? Do you have what it takes to, to start a business? Um, and really, that comes down to starting companies. As you can see on the slide over here, these are three companies that I started before Tether that didn't work. Mm -hmm. Cryptex was uh, the first ever Bitcoin payment gateway in New Zealand that we started in 2013. Um, we were way before our time, um, so even though Bitcoin and blockchain businesses are now starting to boom, uh, we were a bit too ahead of the time and so Cryptex didn't really work. Uh, Nyla was another organisation that was uh, formulated to uh, build software products, uh, mainly going into enterprise type organisations trying to figure out what software they needed that didn't have capital to build um, or that there was no SaaS product off the shelf that they could uh, potentially use. So we would go in and try and figure out what software they would, uh, we could build on their behalf. And then Dibs was actually uh, a pretty cool project. We were trying to reduce waste to landfill by creating a marketplace where individuals could list the things that they didn't want um, and people uh, who wanted those things could then basically claim them uh, from them for free, essentially. But um, when starting a business and all these businesses that have, that have basically failed uh, for me, um, there's always successes that come out of it. And the biggest thing that came out was um, essentially the team, right? So for us uh, and for me specifically, the most important thing when it comes to building a startup is the people that you build it with. Uh, and through all those failures, uh, the Cryptexes, the Nilos, the Dibs, is what it gave for me as a founder was the ability to build the most amazing team. Um, these are my team members currently that have uh, helped us build Tether. Some of, us have, some of them have been there from the very inception all the way from Cryptex and all the way through. Uh, and it's without these people that um, I would never have been able to build Tether. We would never have been able to build Tether to what it is um, today. The next thing, once, you have, uh, once you've established that you're an entrepreneur, you know that you have the right team. The next thing is actually the idea. Ideas come quite simply, really, or at least for some people they do, but the ability to deliver on those ideas or, or um, the ability to uh, create a business from an idea is, is actually quite tough. For us, the idea actually um, came from some conversations that we had with building science community and the Zealand Green Building Council, which the New Zealanders will know quite intimately. Um, there are a lot of rating tools out there. Homestar is one of them. Through our previous company, Nilo, we were looking at building an automated tool for, um, for the Homestar process. Uh, and as a result of that, we had some very heavy engagement with the building science community. And we found the idea came out from a problem we found with the ability to verify that a building rating um, performed 
in the way that it should. So uh, if you know anything about building ratings, they're basically an as uh, a point in time assessment built on as built conditions. But the building science community had a problem with verifying that the rating that they had established or had given that building actually performed. Um, now a building, as we now know as the tether team, is actually a symbiotic relationship between the occupants and the building themselves. Um, but being able to figure out and find out how those occupants impact that living condition and how that building responds to the occupant's behavior is actually a tough thing to do unless you have the right technology in place. So we needed to find a, a way that we could monitor the environmental quality in buildings without relying on that building's utility. So it had to be free of Wi-Fi, because Wi-Fi can sometimes be very flaky, it's not ubiquitous, it relies on power. Um, and it needed to be a device that was battery powered. It couldn't rely on being plugged into a wall um, because someone can unplug it. It needs to be in a partic particular position. So you're looking at an environmental quality sensor or, or network that does not rely, like a smoke alarm, on the building's facilities itself. Once you've established that, once you've found a piece of technology that can do that, and you can extract that data, then you have well, what we found was the foundation of being able to establish um, how that building responds to that environment environmental quality to that, to that occupant's behavior. The pictures that you can see up here, these are um, the very, very beginnings of Tether. I believe that every single startup should start in their mother's garage. That is my <laughs> mother's garage. You can see on the far left hand side, it's very, very clean, which will probably give, give you an indication <laughs> of my mother as well. Um, those are our first 550 Tether and Viracues that shipped to our first customer, uh, which we were very proud of. Um, the EnviroQ, just for reference, uh, measures temperature, relative humidity, carbon dioxide, light, atmospheric pressure, and ambient sound um, in one version. So, um, moving on, the next part of building a business is timing. I believe that timing is absolutely everything. Um, hence, if you go back to the first company that we, we started here, uh, Cryptex, which was the blockchain business, uh, even though the, the business could have scaled massively if it wait, waited five to six years, um, we didn't have that luxury, so timing in that instance was incredibly important for us. Uh, and what was, what's good around the timing around Tether is healthy home standards. Um, we know that New Zealand's got a big problem with housing at the moment, specifically being cold, damp. Uh, and all the issues that come with that, the respiratory issues, mental health issues, and living in a bad quality home. So the timing was perfect for Tether, and we managed to catch the wave at the very point when you know, media was building up with it, government wanted to look at, at healthy homes, uh, and we were providing a solution that nobody else was. So we were very lucky in that respect. So after you have the entrepreneurship down, the team down, you got the idea, the timing's right, then you need to validate the product and the service. Um, and for us, we were really lucky that straight off the bat we managed to win um, a couple of really good uh, contracts, both in the government and private sector. Uh, the, the main question that we asked ourselves uh, once we had established our prototype products was, who actually wants this? Who actually wants to know what, uh, what environmental quality is important, why environmental quality is, impo is important. Uh, and as you can see on the, on the screen, basically anyone who has a large portfolio of property, either under management or ownership, with a social or financial responsibility for ensuring healthy environments would want our products. So, um, you know, your mom and pop um, sort of owner-occupier won't really care in certain aspects. They may not, and they could probably buy an environmental quality sensor from you know, Lowell Leeming or something along those lines. But if you have a large company that has a large portfolio of property or schools or something along those lines, they want to understand how those properties are performing, but they want to do it in a way that doesn't encroach on the occupant's privacy, that is completely separated from the property like a smoke alarm, and can get valuable data reliably from that space. Um, so we had a validation point, which was really good. Um, and then the next thing, the all most important question in a lot of startups' minds, the money. Where does the money come from? Um, for ourselves, there was an element of luck, friends and family is what I call it. So um, we've raised no capital to date, which we're quite lucky or, and happy to do. The luck part of it came from the first business that we did, which was Cryptex. Um, I was quite lucky, I guess, to be involved in the blockchain space from its very early inception and managed to capitalize on that at the end of the 2017 where uh, there was a big run-up um, in terms of valuation of crypto assets. Uh, so that gave us enough, or gave me enough uh, startup capital to essentially fund the growth of Tether. Uh, and then I've got um, generous friends and family and um, some of my uh, team 
also have generous friends and family, so we managed to get some funds from them to eventually f to fund this idea and to, uh, and to be able to, to grow it. Um, and then probably the, the fourth and most important one when it comes to growing uh, a startup is patience, tena tenacity, and unwavering belief. Mm. You need to have patience. You need to know that this is going to work. You need to be able to go through all the different cycles of second guessing yourself, um, not knowing whether the product's going to work, constantly reiterate, make sure that you improve, and just believe in yourself, believe in your team, believe in what you're trying to achieve. Because um, markets come and go, opportunities come and go, um, but as long as you have a good solid team around you uh, and the idea is solid and you know that you're adding value to a marketplace, you cannot, uh, you have to succeed. That's just the way it is, really. Um, so that's my presentation on Tether. I know I didn't go into any of the technical details, but it's, everything's on our website. So if you did you know, want to know about how we work technically um, from an IoT space, you can just hop on there or um, contact me. My contact details are on there as well. Awesome, Brandon. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank, I think like going into some of the details around actually the challenges of starting and scaling a business mm -hmm. uh, is, is invaluable. I think mm -hmm. that's something that this week we haven't done a huge amount of. So thank mm -hmm. you so much for, for taking the time to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your, your entrepreneurial journey began, I believe, in 2002. Uh, you know, yeah. I believe you were at school. You started yeah. the first tuck shop at your yeah. boarding school, allowing the purchase of goods on credit. So yeah. tell me about those early entrepreneurial experiences yeah. and what came from that. So um, I was in boarding school my whole life. So since the age of nine, yeah. which is quite interesting. Wow. And um, in our senior boarding school, which is basic, I don't know what form it is, but it was back then it was <laughs> standard six to matric, so the last five years of school. Was this in New Zealand? This is in South Africa. Okay. Yeah, yeah so standards, not, not forms. Um, and the boarding school, basically, you had these different corridors that were different standards were, were separated from each other. Yeah. And I was number six academically inside in, in the boarding school. And number six had their own dorm inside the boarding school and one to five <laughs> had dorms outside right. the boarding school, their own private dorms. Yeah, yeah. But you got electricity in your own private dorm. So it was called the skull dorm because it was really, really small. Yeah. And um, because we had electricity, I could basically get a fridge in there. Mm. Right. So I thought, well, what do people want? in the middle of the night, and specifically at movie night, which is on Fridays, yes. is chips, sweets, chocolates, and cool drinks, <laughs> right? So I got my mom to, to buy me a whole bunch of different cool drinks and chips and chocolates and all that kind of stuff, put them in the fridge. And then uh, before movie night, I ended up getting some youngsters to run around and take orders. Yeah. First, I realized the first time I did this, nobody had money because they'd spent through all their money the yep. entire week. So I said, well, let's start a credit system. So I basically got an order book, ordered, you know, the, anybody could order whatever they wanted. And of course, kids mm -hmm. that have a credit system just spend as, phrase, much, as, as much as possible. Yeah, yeah. And then on Sunday, when people came back to boarding school, I'd do collection. Okay, and I'd amazing. send the same people to get collected. And I, I basically raised enough money to buy my first car cash wow. through my tuck shop over the first year. Yeah. And um, the good thing about collecting on Sundays is the parents are dropping them off, right? Yeah, so you can get the money from ex there. Exactly right. So yeah. all the money's with them. So they'll have no money for the rest of the week, but yeah. then they can just buy in credit again. Yeah. So it was, it was, um, That's amazing. It was a very lucrative business yeah. for me at a very young age. It yeah. reminds me of a good friend of mine who went to boarding school in Switzerland, and she grew up in America, <laughs> and she used to buy like American candy and take it to Switzerland where they couldn't buy it and sell it to her <laughs> Swiss, <laughs> Swiss friends for like $50, and it would cost like 60 cents back in the US. Yeah, so entrepreneurship. Yeah. so many. <laughs> exactly. That's <laughs> Capitalism yeah. and its finest. Thank you so much for sharing. I've got so many more questions, but before we get into that, I'm going to pass over to Nicholas for your presentation now. Oh, thank thank you. you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm an entrepreneur as well. I've been building companies for the last four years. Disclosure, I started early. Uh, Open Parallel was founded in 2010, mostly to do specialist software uh, developments. In original customers were the likes of Intel or ARM. So we specialize in rapid research and development, but most importantly, it's ecosystem building. So we have also a parent uh, conference called Multicore World, and we have been involved with the largest IT project in history, which is the Square Kilometer Array Radio Telescope, which in some way links me to Brandon's home uh, <laughs> place, which is South Africa. This will be built between South Africa and Australia and New Zealand. It's privileged to be a full member, still a full member of the SKA project, which it's a once in a generation opportunity to change what uh, New Zealand can do in high tech for generations to come. So the whole point of Open Parallel being involved with this uh, project is to learn about what the future will be. So I technically have been in the future for the last decade or so, which allows me to 
uh, look at certain platforms from a completely different perspective. Uh, there are cycles about how technology is being built, how corporations design them, and those cycles allows you to see, okay, this is when things will hit the market in the next five or ten years. Uh, for all my sense, I also did some venture capital about a decade ago, <laughs> but essentially I'm an entrepreneur by default. I actually did a Master of Entrepreneurship here at the Otago University, probably 25 years after I started becoming an entrepreneur, but that's just to uh, improve my accent. Mm -hmm. So, because the Open Parallel website is not necessarily flashy, I thought that, okay, let's put some knowledge here that could be of use for the audience in general. So, and uh, draw an intersection of something that, to me, it's crucial about IoT becoming uh, successful, becoming meaningful. Otherwise, it's just a buzzword here and there. So, I will go through a few slides about the intersection of IoT and high performance computing. And uh, as usual as I do in my presentations, I uh, start for the end. Uh, usually the attention span of people is three minutes, so let's find, these are the conclusions. And <laughs> this is the last slide. And then I will fulfill with a few other slides if the, uh, okay, so. You have the technology today. IoT has been around for some time, and there is a little mistake. It's actually the Internet for things. Internet of things has been a new, uh, it's easier to say that, but essentially IoT is not necessarily something new. Instead of Internet between humans and devices, it's Internet for devices. In the other hand, high performance computing has been around for decades. Now, HPC has been within the realm of uh, large organizations. Now, uh, what, uh, are, what's happening with IoT these days is that someone thought, okay, it's a good idea to throw all these cheap sensors all over the place and let's see what comes back. Now, suddenly they have a, date, the, a deluge of data that how do you process, how do you make sense of that? So things will become complicated once you realize that you can have information in, from this, from that, on those. Therefore, if you don't understand systems, you don't understand how you put these things together, you either are in problems or you are at the mercy of whoever is your vendor or your supplier. So if you don't control platforms, then you are doomed. You are just buying whatever your uh, supplier or vendor or organization is selling. And the point of controlling platforms just happened a couple of days ago when Huawei has been banned from using Android, which is not necessarily banned, but it's the whole concept of platform versus vendor. So that's why I highlight that platforms are essential. <coughs> Access to them decides business success, and most importantly, technology independence. So there are many ways of being dependent in the world economic, political, whatever. At the end of the day, if you follow the history of humanity, and I am already part of history with this here color, <laughs> so you will realize that the ones who has the technology actually dominate a number of things. So uh, that's my involvement with the Square Kilometer Array Radio Telescope. That could literally give technology independence in a number of areas for New Zealand. And whoever is listening, please talk to your MP, Talk to your minister, it's important. But let's go back to IoT. The awareness is variable. It's something that will be asked later. And my concern here, which is something that's happening in the last decade or so, it's, it's always trendy to use buzzwords. Now, I have white hair, I have a strange accent, I speak, I can put a lot of trendy words together and sound like it's wisdom. Mm -hmm. Now, you put that in the words of someone who tweets 200 tweets per day or a media outlet and really no one knows what they are talking about. They are just repeating, repeating, repeating and that becomes fake news in one way or other. So the awareness depends on who are you listening to. Mm -hmm. And it's not about uh, distrusting, it's just keep asking questions. How much this IoT thing actually works? Which brings me to the point of what you underpin all this, the hardware, the operating systems, and most importantly, the security are core for IoT to actually be a really internet for things. And once you have a secure system, once you have a secure hardware, 
once you have something that actually works for your business needs, not for your suppliers, not for your entourage, for your business purposes, then you can consider using high performance computing. And that's why I submit that the usage will differentiate a leader from a follower. Mm. Because it's, uh, at the end of the day, uh, there are no uniqueness here. It's how you serve your customers or how you perform in the most cost effective and excellent way. I thought to mention a few new business models that uh, will emerge thanks to the Internet for Things. But uh, they could be either radical or they could be modi modifications. And I put a simple example there about how horses moved into cars. That was radical. But then the cars created the petrol stations in order to service that. I mean, created is not the right thing. Today, the petrol station sells foods and groceries. I mean, I live in a high technology hub called Wamaru. Yeah. <laughs> and the petrol station there is 24-7 open and is a very important social hub. Right? So anyway, this is my presentation and uh, now we can start. <laughs> <laughs> so essentially the question, the title of that presentation is that are converging, are teaming up? And the direct answer is no. I've been doing this in the supercomputing conference in the States for three or four years with a couple of colleagues. It, having sessions to see how uh, the communities, diverse communities worldwide are thinking, and it's literally two sets that are not necessarily intersecting yet. And when I say it depends, it depends how you define IoT, how you define HPC. So I will uh, leave this, and then we we'll go straight to the concept of systems. Mm. You are collecting a lot of data, but this was written for someone called John Gall long time ago. Now, a complex system become complex as an evolution of a simple system that actually function. So you keep putting stuff on top of it. However, if you design a complex system from scratch, that won't work. And you will start to patch it, just make it more complex and it's less work. Ask anyone in government, ask IRD systems, ask everything, NHS in Britain. You start small and then you build on top. And the whole point of this is about IoT. You are tempted to buy 200,000 sensors just because they are cheap. The radical change of the Internet of Things is that you can access this hardware. Mm. Would that give you the answer? It's, everything comes down to what Brandon said. If you understand your business, you understand business 101 of your uh, organization, then you can buy the technology, incorporate the technology that matters. So the small systems also fail. So you can have many sensors out there. Uh, this is at the end of the day, that's why it's Internet for Things. The whole definition of Internet was to create a system that, even if it's broken in certain parts, keep moving. It was a guy that I had the pleasure to discuss things with him. Its name is Vinton Cerf. Perhaps you heard about Vin Cerf. It's today a uh, vice president of a startup called Google. But uh, in due day, he just wrote a paper about the TCP IP protocol, which that's why we call him the father of the internet. And DARPA, the Department of Research of the uh, United States government, asked essentially the challenge was, look, we need to have a system that it's, it's not invulnerable. It just, if it fails in a node, needs to keep going. Mm. IoT needs to be the same, but you need to have a spatial and temporal fusion of sensor data, even if you're using data in a local side. And then that's not HPC, you don't need high performance computing for that. You need to use it for what comes later. Because if you are collecting data and you don't know what to do with it, you're wasting time, money, resources. Get out of my way, let's do other things. But if you start to do real machine learning, by real machine learning, I am not saying predictive text in our cell phones. One that uses algorithms that has been designed for exascale computing, not the algorithm that has been designed 200 years ago and now suddenly get adapted. That when HPC comes in. Now failure, it's normal not only in entrepreneurship but in systems. So it's interesting to draw those analogies. 
Uh, I use the word dear edge. Now edge, it's a new buzzword and I am being reluctant to, I, I'm tempted to be sarcastic with myself. I hate buzzwords, but I need to use them because you implement them and then you are associated to that. So uh, computing at the edge is not only collecting as a dumb device, but actually processing and doing compute where the data is generated. The classic example is the self-moving car that takes a decision in an intersection. Should I kill those kids or that old lady crossing or commit driver suicide? What will be the insurance be? <laughs> so that's, uh, you cannot uh, rely on latency to send information back to the cloud. It's a decision that needs to be taken. So before that absurd example happens, trust me, it's not that absurd, uh, you need to validate. You need to do simulation. Mm -hmm. And the high performance computing models are especially important when you simulate failure. I was once in a conference when someone from the Air Force of the United States said, hey, thanks to modeling, we are saving not only money, we are saving time. Mm. Usually it took us 25 years to fully simulate a plane from design to, uh, I mean, we cannot avoid for, uh, how can I say, we can simulate a crash without killing anyone. So. Let me just move forward. Uh, this is just something that we did in Open Parallel at the time. You just need to read the first thing at the top, which says water management. Then you have a little device that you can buy for 100 bucks. Then there is an equation that you find in Wikipedia. Then you do some measurements and some tests, and you can save 90% of power. This is the story that you need to share with your council or whatever. Using this, I save you 90%. Mm. The magic in between, oh, we can talk about that, but at the end of the day, you have a problem, we can solve it using this. So, uh, that's probably the most important thing that I want to share today, which okay. is security. You have all these sensors, you have all the things that you bought from someone. Everyone buy, and they are cheap, you don't know how they are manufactured. Everyone can buy in something in a $2 shop, and you already are comfortable with the risk. Okay, what can I expect from this watch if it costs me two bucks versus a Swiss watch which costs me $200,000? Well, they still give me the same time, and the time is exactly the same, but I am comfortable with the risk. I can buy 200 watches of that, and that's it. The same with IoT. And that's my main concern. There are certain top uh, concepts there that I highlight about spoofing or transduction. It's not clingdom. It's <laughs> certain physical concepts about how to, um, uh, there is a lady say, uh, using some signs in the back that I don't <laughs> understand what she's doing. <laughs> so, okay, should I finish? Yeah, I think we're going to jump into questions soon, just conscious of okay. time. Okay, so um, that's what I did, the, li the, the last conclusion. Yeah. This is one of the answers. And uh, here are the conclusions again. Okay. <laughs> well, it's fascinating stuff. It's fascinating stuff. Mm -hmm. And what, I, I want to sort of jump into... Um, I'm going to be the guy that asks some stupid questions to kick this off because there's so much complexity and uh, you know technical stuff and I know that there's people tuning in from all around the country who aren't sort of super technical so I'm just going to ask like the most basic question for those that might not be familiar when we talk about the internet of things the internet for things what does that look like in the everyday household in 10 years from now like for my mum sitting at home watching this for example like how would you explain it to her oh she's already using it I mean, uh, what does it look like in 10 years though? Uh, more. Give me an example of what that might look like in everyday application. Well, everyone wants to, uh, everyone wants to see the fridge ordering the groceries without me understanding or I'm running out of uh, milk or the chicken it's uh, past the due date. These things happen today. Mm. I think that the more will be was related to, for example, what Brandon says, how to measure the health on the, on the community or the family. The, that needs to be driven by larger uh, initiatives. If the government decides, oh, we actually want to control the dump houses in, I don't know, South Eden or South Oakland or wherever, mm, mm. then there's a, designs a program where you have a, 
you are just not buying standard devices. Yes. Otherwise, it's just you are just buying two dollar shop kind of things, and then you will find everything. Yeah. So everything being connected, the idea is that when you when you everything might, will fail. Yeah. When you <laughs> might run That's out. That's the whole. That my, my point <laughs> is that we are going too fast. And therefore, everything will crash, and we will have an interesting cow. Yeah. And uh, Brendan, you know, Internet, Internet <laughs> of Things has been around for a while. Why do you think it hasn't been picked up faster? I don't think the technology has been there yet. Well, the thing about Internet of Things, from my perspective, is that a lot of people think about the device, they think about the technology. They don't think about the, the problem it's solving. Yes. What solution am I creating? What value am I creating? Yeah. And then when you think about the value that you're trying to create, you need to be able to match technology against that value. Yeah. And it needs to be done in a seamless way that's also cost effective and scalable. Right. The technology hasn't existed up until right. the last couple of years. And right. now we're starting to see things starting to come out. What's, what's the piece of technology that's most lacking right now? Um, so, well, at the moment, I don't think there is technology that's lacking. I think with the, the advent of, of low power wide area networks, which is what our device yes. uses, so not having to rely on Wi-Fi connectivity, yeah. battery power is becoming a, a little bit more pervasive as microchips start to use less power. So you're starting to find see ecosystems that can evolve or can control themselves without having to have human intervention. Okay. Right? So like a smoke alarm, you think yes. about a smoke alarm, there's a smoke alarm in every single house. Yep. Um, nobody thinks about it you know, not working, working. It just sits there mm -hmm. and it adds value And that if there's a fire, you'll get alerted for it, right? Yep. Now, if you think about taking that concept and extrapolating it way out yeah, yeah, and yeah. think about responsive buildings, yes. buildings that actually um, can move and respond and yep. um, change, you know, atmospheric levels mm -hmm. automatically without people actually knowing about it, but, it, but the building responds as occupants move in and out of it, as they live inside that building. So it becomes an organism of its, by itself. Mm. That can only be done with connected technology that doesn't rely on the occupant providing the, the input the, right. the, or into, into, that, into that ecosystem. Okay, so. and I think, I think one of you may, may have touched on this, but the introduction of 5G, what sort of impact will that, will that have? Well, 5G will have an impact, no, no doubt, but um, difficult to run battery-powered devices on, a, on 5G. It, it's just, it's just at this point in time, it's just very, very power hungry. So you need yeah. to hard power it, which is fine. You can plug it in or wire it into yeah. a wall, um, which, which means you need to build the, build the building or build the piece of tech with 5G in mind. Mm. I think it's very difficult to retrofit 5G. Yeah. Um, 5G the beauty of IoT is to run with low power and yeah. low bandwidth yeah. in conditions that are adaptable to pretty much everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's as it, hap it happens in every utility, and I mean it's uh, sanitation or electricity, at the end of the day, the lowest common denominator is the one that will drive the implementation. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the focuses of this session is, is obviously about IoT with, within agriculture. Mm -hmm. So what, if, what sort of a, uh, some of the effects, just going into a little bit deeper, that you expect this to have on Kiwi farmers in five or ten years from now? I saw an example of hands-free hectare, which is, I can't remember, it's in the UK. Okay. It's one hectare that it's entirely, uh, it's planted, harvested, produce everything without any human intervention. Mm. So you have a hectare and then everything happens with devices. Uh, there is robotics, there is connectivity, and it's pretty simple. Okay. There is no science fiction. Now the open question is how you go from a pilot into general implementation. Mm. It's, uh, we are not looking into uh, big technology um, novelties. It's about social acceptance, it's about, um, it's just market trends. I mean, certain things happen. Let's think about stop smoking, that's yes. not IoT. Well, for the last 40 years, someone knew that people die from smoking. Still, you go to other countries, uh, different than New Zealand, and people smoke like a chimney. Well, it's a social norm. Yeah. IoT will be in that social fabric in one way or other. Yeah, and you mentioned the gentleman from Google and you know other, I guess there's so many, what country around the world or what companies are truly leading this race? Because you obviously have the major tech companies, the Googles, the Microsofts, the Apples, you know, all trying to win. Well, they instead of lead, they want to dominate, which mm. is the definition. Who's dominating now? Who's, who's uh, winning the race? That's a fight. That's a battle for the internet. That's been around for the last decade or so. Um, so I'm not trying to present a doom scenario, it's just in the same way that you had decades ago the battle of who are the largest, I don't know, 
oil company mm. or when Microsoft was everything. Well, guess what? Google Docs exist. So these things happen. Yeah. Sorry yeah. that I'm bringing that into a macro level. No, no. But after it's decades of working at micro, you start to realize that everything connects in a way. And yeah. IoT, it's a perfect analogy. Yeah. yeah. Brandon, who, who do you draw the most inspiration from? <laughs> AWS probably. Okay. Well, I'll tell you why, because they give us the ability to, to scale our product, right? Yes. So, so all of our systems are built on AWS yeah, microservices yeah, yeah. Yeah. using some pretty pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Um, so we design our own hardware just because nobody else has done it. So we design our own hardware from the ground up. Everything's built, built by us actually in a factory on the North Shore, okay. which is cool, which yeah, is pretty cool. Yeah. But all of our, our mobile applications, our portal, our da dashboards, all that stuff is all done on, on AWS ecosystem. Okay. So I don't think you'll have one ring to rule them all. I think yeah. you'll have different different components of the ecosystem that, that basically work together in, in some sort of yeah. similar way. But I tell you kind of something about AWS, and this is something that governments and societies need to be concerned, mm. which is data sovereignty. There are mm. certain inputs of data that literally, even by regulation or by law, needs to be into certain jurisdictions. So mm. I have a, an associate a colleagues with a company called Catalyst or Catalyst Cloud. They have, uh, their servers are mm. in New Zealand. Now you. My taxes are in Texas. Do I care? Does the IRD care? Well, it's a conversation that perhaps needs to be discussed more mm. often. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that everything is in flux. Mm. That's why I come back to two uh, core concepts that I try to highlight today. Understanding systems and understanding security. Exactly. Yeah. Security is not about being afraid. It's just to be comfortable with the risk. That's yeah, my yeah. $2 shop clock. I mean, are you comfortable with that? You know that it will fail. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've heard we've heard a lot about um, the technical side of, of uh, IoT, and it's been fascinating. I feel like I've learned so much. But I want to go a little bit more into your uh, both of your personal journeys now, because mm. you spoke a lot about your journey, and we, uh, you know, mm. you talked about your first entrepreneurial experiences. You know, for those who are thinking about taking the leap and want to start something, but yeah. they're sort of like sitting on the edge of should I do this, should I not? What advice would you give them about, uh, you know, deciding whether to go and start a business or not, based on your own experiences, <laughs> Brandon? It's tough, man. <laughs> yeah. It is. It is tough. Like, look, f for me personally, you have to have, you have to be built that way. Yeah. I, and I know that's it's quite flippant to say that, but it's not glamorous. I mean, I feel entrepreneurship has been <laughs> glamorized quite a bit. Mm. Um, the new you know. rock stars, right? Well, <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, even and even now, I mean, it, we, we tear the is. We are the guys who sing before the rock stars. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, <laughs> Ted has been successful in its, own, in its own right, and you know, we've only been around for 18 months, but we're still just at the beginning. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, things could go wrong, really, yeah, you know, yeah, at yeah. Any, any one stage, but this is why I'm saying, for me, it's about the, the team, it's about yeah. the idea, it's, it's building up, this is where, what I love. I love working with really mm -hmm. smart people, building yeah. cool products. Yeah. And, if, and, and for me, it's just, that's what gets me up in the morning. As I enjoy the creativity, I enjoy interacting with people. I, yeah. I'm a systems engineer by qualification, yeah. so I enjoy the tech side of things, which also helps. Yeah. But it's, um, so to, to, your, to your question, what, what advice would I give? Yeah. Make sure it's not about the notoriety. Yeah. Make sure it's not about the money. Yeah. Make sure it's because you genuinely want to do something Post that, boundaries that changes the way the, the, the world works. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's, and, yeah, and yeah, a question yeah. for both of you. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, yeah. I'm really passionate about this. And yeah. after I started, I don't know, 20, 25 companies, yes. either mine with others, mm. which had a life cycle between, I don't know, three weeks to 25 years. Yeah. So pff, I'm not sure if that's a qualification, but certainly mm. it's a track record. Mm. My simple advice is just start. The yeah. most difficult thing is to start. Mm. You never learn to swim by walking around the swimming pool. Exactly. Right? Yes. If you need to do it, you get wet. But as Brandon say, do it for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. Every time that I try to do something f for making money, mm -hmm. it didn't make money and even fail. Every time that yeah. I did or I'm doing things for the right reasons, it just keep moving. Why? Because talent needs purpose. Exactly. And then you start something and as he said, the team it's the only thing that matters. Yeah. yeah, it was when I interviewed uh, Sir Michael Hill, the founder of Michael mm -hmm. Hill Jewelry. He said to he said to me on camera, um, the most difficult decision we have to make is actually making the decision to do it. Yeah, yeah. It's once you take that first step, as you say, then uh, everything starts to fall. There is a place. quote Could about if everything is under control, you are just not going fast yeah. enough. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Qu question for you both. You meet both mm. talk about the importance of team and mm. team being the most important mm. thing. It was a big part of your presentation. Yeah. What's the secret to it? You know, when you're working in these uh, super fascinating 
creating spaces. There's mm. only so much talent, you know, available who have the, you know, the world's best talent as such. Uh, how do you attract the best people in the world to, to work for you when, when there's other interesting companies doing interesting things in the space as well? Um, networking and X Factor, mm -hmm. I'd say. Okay. Do, you've, you've got to be out there talking to people. I mean, before I've be, I go to every single meetup I possibly can. I constantly talk to people. I listen mm -hmm. more than I speak. Mm -hmm. So when, when I go to these things, I want to hear what people are excited about, what they do. I then ask questions around, well, who's the best person in the space? Yes. And then it's then you've got to go on this long journey of trying to befriend that person. Yeah. And, and when, yeah, sorry, carry on. There, there is a lot of energy, time and energy that goes into formulating a strong relationship with someone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you have to be in it for the long haul. Yeah. If you're just going to try and attract them with, you know, bells and whistles and cash, good luck. Yeah, exactly. And, but once they're there, the other thing is retention, right? You can attract retention. good people. It's yeah. easy to get people excited and join a mission, but to keep them there over the long term is a, yeah. a completely different game. You always game. have turnover, yeah. but if Excuse you me. always have turnover. Exactly. Yeah, but yeah. Mm -hmm. if uh, you give purpose, I mean, talented people can find a job anywhere yeah, in the world. Exactly. They just name yeah. their price. I couldn't agree more with that. The simple yeah. fact that they choose to be in New Zealand already tells you something. Mm -hmm. right? uh, they could be anywhere in the world, but they can work remotely. They, if they mm -hmm. want to be involved with something originated from New Zealand, that gives you a purpose. The simple fact of New Zealand gives you part of that purpose, but uh, you are the dumbest person in the world. Yeah. If you are not surrounded by clever people, everyone is wasting their time. Yeah, and Nicholas, you've, you've presented, you know, in, in five continents around the world about the transformative effects of... of it just shows how old am I. Of, <laughs> ...of high tech. Does New Zealand talent stack up against the other continents and countries you've, you've been in, or are we behind or ahead? Uh, you will be surprised the amount of talent which is hiding in little corners in New Zealand. You will be surprised people who is doing things in Tauranga, I'm living in Wamaro. A, a lot of people live in New Zealand because we have internet. Mm. It's not just fiber, we have internet and knowledge doesn't require barriers. So uh, the simple fact of putting things together, it was an ad in Spark or whatever years ago about a symphony and people uh, playing instruments in different parts of the world. They were promoting broadband or mm. whatever. Uh, in the software world, we have been doing this since ever. Mm. The collaboration, it's not, I mean, people say, oh, you, we are in the UK, you will be sleeping. And so what? We, we knew that <laughs> once we started. Yeah. So the transformation from the nine to five world to the internet world happens to someone, I mean, I've been living in the internet for what? 20 years, 30 years. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, talent needs purpose. I don't, Stop repeating that. It's exactly. A it's, it's a great, it's a you, great you, piece of advice. You can find a job, you will be paid for that job, you can be replaced. Yeah, yeah. If you have purpose, doesn't you are not replaced. You are part of a family. Exactly. Brandon, you talk about the, the, the importance of the idea as well as the team. Mm. For those that are trying to come up with great ideas but are just not, you know, I mean, we interview obviously founders of unicorn companies mm. and all around the world and one of the common themes that comes up in these interviews is uh, idea is maybe, I don't know, 20% execution. Mm you know 80% you know a, a, mm. a bad a, a good entrepreneur could make a big business out of a pretty shitty idea and vice versa they normally um, raising capital around that though, is, and exactly then they the money mm -hmm. catastrophically yep that's true yeah. so, so my question to you though is like wh what is the best way to come up with good ideas for those that are trying to come up with something game-changing I think if you have an idea you need to test it immediately and you test it by looking for the people that will ultimately pay for it and then it's about having conversations with as many people in that market as possible and then building really cheap, quick prototypes and then testing the idea against that market as quickly as you can. Mm. So it's having just again as many conversations as you possibly can. Do not, pick, do not become an echo chamber for your own idea and, mm. and your own self-importance. Mm. It's important that you go out and you speak to as many people and even the, the people that say no, this is not going to work are and sometimes more important than the people that say it is mm. because they'll show you where the idea is actually has a, has a chance to fail. Mm. You know, so for us, you know, with, with Tether, we we knew that there was an issue around understanding how a building performs and how to, how to monitor that in a, in a yep. reliable, scalable way. Um, but building the solution took a lot of conversations with a lot yeah. of people. Some people saying, why are you doing this? This is, you know, this is uh, just futile and it's, it's yeah. not going to work and we can't do it this way. Um, but that just gave us more motivation to continually build, re reiterate and then continue to test. Exactly. But it wasn't until we got our first big customer 
that we knew it would work. You know work. it's going to work, yeah. That it's getting it. those, those yeah. customers. Gentlemen, we've only got five minutes left and I want to go through some rapid fire questions to finish. So mm. the shorter the answers, the better for these questions so we can sure. get through a few. For both of you, what lesson in business has taken you the longest to learn, starting with you, Nicholas? Survive. Survive, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't be so nice. Don't be so nice. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And what quality of mind or state of mind in one or two words do you think has best served you in your success so far? Always be positive, but not in a naive way. Okay. Uh, you, you are full of wishful thinking. Yeah. Now, uh, once you have an unjustifiable optimism that things will go in that way, they will. And also at the same time, don't be naive on times. Okay, I will keep pushing just because I want. Mm. Great right. advice. What about you, Brandon? Unwavering optimism. Unwavering <laughs> optimism. I love it. Yeah. And uh, you know, Nicholas, you've you've mentioned uh, you've mentioned your, you've jokingly referred to your age a few times. What what do you think the sixteen year old boy you were would think of the man you've become today? The sixteen year old boy. What? Sorry. What do you think the sixteen year old boy you were would think of the man you've become today? Oof. I can't remember when I was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that the, there is a consistency on uh, always. I call myself a professional ignorant, meaning that I always keep asking questions. But those questions are actually, uh, you need to avoid trying to show off by the question. You really need to ask a question because you want to know. Yeah. And you want to do something with that knowledge. Yeah. And Brandon, if you were looking at, at the 16-year-old version of yourself, giving him one piece of advice, what would you say to him? Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, in I mean, hindsight, it's very easy to yeah, do. Yeah, yes. <laughs> exactly. And what, what single entrepreneur in the world do both of you look up to the most and why? Uh, him? <laughs> I mean, uh, role models are something very ephemeral. Okay. And there are... There are They're everywhere. They, yes, and there are the circle. To me, the, a big entrepreneur is the guy who lives in a slum and still survives and yep. do the decent thing, trying to sell, I don't know, second-hand things. It's a great answer. Yeah, it's so a great it's answer. A, Brandon says something very important in a slide there, which is luck. Yeah. You can be surrounded by resources or investors. I raised capital, I spent money. Yeah. Uh, luck plays a very important mm. and you just need to learn how to leverage yeah. that. No, I see. Mm -hmm. Great answer. Um, Joe Rogan. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And uh, just because he lives his life the way he wants to and doesn't yeah. ask any permission from anyone. Great, mm -hmm. great. And just before we finish off, mm -hmm. what, uh, what's a, something that both of you believe to be true that not many people agree with you on? So a contrarian opinion that you hold about the world um, or the way, the way the world works? Does the world work? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, civilization has been changing in different ways, but this is not a standard answer. So, yeah. uh, to me, sometimes the big truth that I thought decades ago is to see the world in one way. Uh, time, experience, travel, failure give me the insight to say, no, mm. same thing happens. A diff I mean, a red light in uh, New Zealand, it's stop. In South America or South Africa, it's a suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a standard thing. Uh, same happened with everything. It, it's, uh, it's a flow. Yeah, break the road rules, kids. That's <laughs> the, the, the advice this. And what about you, Brandon? Uh, that's a difficult one. I'd say the path to peace is not de-individuation. OK. Mm. It's very, very, very uh, insightful. Thank you. And just, just to finish, um, uh, Nicholas, I read that I read that you can ask for a bear in five different languages. Um, Again, can you can you get, can you give us a few of those? Uh, well, I I was born in Uruguay in South America from Hungarian parents, so I was educated in Hungarian. So they sent me to kindergarten to just learn bloody Spanish. And I'm old enough to be in a country where the second standard language was French. So whatever you hear from me, it's what I learned in the fourth term. But actually, the only language that I want to learn was Portuguese. Oh, wow. Well. Because you are in a small country besides Brazil, so. Yeah, and what, what catalyzed your move from South Africa to New Zealand? Go. Oh, really? <laughs> Are you still together today? No. Right. Okay. So you're chasing a Kiwi girl over yeah, there? Yeah, well, I've got my, my whole family was here before. Okay. I've got an elder sister and a younger sister that live here. So okay. I, I followed them 
it's a long story. Okay, no, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do another interview on that. Well, thank yeah. you so much, guys, for taking the time. It's a hu been a huge honor, and I feel like I've learned so much, you know, not just about the, the technical complexities of, of the subject we've been talking about, Internet of Things, but also about entrepreneurialism. And um, I love the way we sort of weaved between advice for entrepreneurs and then also the, the subject of Internet of Things. So thank you so much for, for your time, for both being here today, and thank you so much to the viewers uh, for tuning in today on Tech Week TV here in Dunedin. Uh, brought to you by Callahan Innovation. It's, uh, you know, it's been a huge honor to conduct these interviews this week and we, we still have a busy day ahead. So continue to tune in throughout the day and we will be back with you shortly on Tech Week TV. Thank you so much.